We're in Acts chapter 17. On the day of Pentecost, the church was born. Sorry to have to hear me repeat this every week. I just want to make sure we're all up to speed on what has been happening. I think it's so cool to see the whole flow of the book. So that's why I do this every week. The day of Pentecost, um, the church is born. It's in the springtime. It began with the Holy Spirit filling the believers. The apostles go out in power. They preach about Jesus, and the church grows. By chapter 7, we saw persecution beginning to hit the church. Um, Stephen is the first one to die for his faith. And one of the men behind the persecution, the fellow named Saul, that's his Hebrew name. Um, when Saul is headed for the city of Damascus in Acts chapter 9, he's knocked off his high horse and he meets Jesus. And we have come to know Saul a little better by his Roman name, Paul. Um, by chapter 10, the gospel has begun to reach even the Gentiles, starting with a Roman centurion named Cornelius. By chapter 13, we began a new section in the book of Acts where, uh, uh, where we see the, the ministry of Paul and Barnabas initially, and uh, it takes them from the city of Antioch on this uh, kind of a strange shape um, across to the island of Cyprus. This is the land of Galatia, and then they head back again to Antioch. After that first trip, they go to uh, Jerusalem where they take part in the Grand Council in Jerusalem where they discuss the issue of how in the world can Gentiles really be saved? Do they need to be circumcised? Do they need to become Jewish like the rest of the, all of us? And they come to the conclusion that salvation is by faith alone. Salvation is because of what God has done for us, the grace that God has shown towards us and we simply need to trust him. And, and I'm, sure all the, I'm sure all the Gentiles breathe the great collective sigh of relief. <laughs> we don't have to get circumcised. <laughs> We've now seen Paul off on his second missionary journey. He's taking Silas as his traveling companion. And uh, we, will, we saw them last week starting off in Antioch again and heading first over to the Galatian churches. Um, they're not going to head over to Cyprus. And they're going to go through the Galatian churches and then cross uh, what we consider, this is modern Turkey, this area here. They head off to Troas, and from Troas, they're going to jump across the sea on a boat um, to across the Aegean Sea to Philippi, which is in the land of Macedonia. And we saw them jailed in Philippi for a while, and now they're going to start heading uh, south from Philippi. We pick it up in chapter 17. Um, now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Now, we're going to watch another map. So, from Philippi to Thessalonica, it's about 80 miles. They're going to be heading from Philippi to Amphipolis, and then from Amphipolis to Apollonia, uh, and then from Apollonia, they're going to head over here to Thessalonica. Uh, the modern city of Thessaloniki, it sounds kind of, fam sounds like it, it is, same name, is on the same spot. It's a huge, pretty good sized city, 385,000 people. It's also known in some circles as you take off the Thess, and they call it Salonica or Salonica. Um, it's the second largest city in Greece today. It was a huge city in Paul's day as well. When it says they went through Amphipolis and Apollonia, these were apparently um, pretty good sized cities, but Paul doesn't stop in them. Some people have suggested that maybe it's because there weren't any Jewish synagogues there, maybe, but he does go on to Thessalonica. He is traveling. Um, a well-known Roman road called the Via Ignatia, um, which kind of connected uh, from Greece, from Turkey, going through Greece. This is the Via Ignatia, and it would go on through Thessalonica and then cross across the uh, the Greek Peninsula. Um, he's going to get off of it in Thessalonica. He's going to get off this road. Um, Thessalonica 
was a city founded in 315 BC by King Cassander of Macedon. He named it after his wife, Thessaloniki, who was the half-sister of Alexander the Great. Um, by 41 BC, it had become a free city, free city of the Roman Republic. It was a major city in the empire, and it was the capital of the entire region. It was a chief seaport of Macedonia, the chief seaport, and it was a center for trade. So this is a big city. This is not just a little, uh, uh, a little wayside village. He heads to the major city, the second biggest city in, in, uh, in Greece, what we call Greece nowadays. And there was a synagogue of the Jews there. Um, unlike Philippi, remember we talked last week about how Philippi, well, the, the rule among the Jews is that if you have 10 male Jews in a city, you can form a synagogue. Otherwise, you have to go outside of the city and meet somewhere for a place of prayer. Well, in Philippi, there was not enough Jews to form a synagogue. That's why they were meeting down by the river. Not so in Thessalonica. There's a, there is a synagogue in Thessalonica. Verse 2, then Paul, as his custom was, went into them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead, saying, this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. Now it says that he was reasoning with them for three Sabbaths. It almost makes it sound like he was only there for three weeks. We think it may have actually been a little bit longer than three weeks. There's a couple other scriptures that talk about this, that in Paul's writings, that give you the impression it had to have been a little bit longer than three weeks. Remember, he's like 80 miles from Philippi. He writes to the Philippians years from this point. He'll write to them about this this time. And he says, for even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. You know, we think that Philippians chapter 4, that's, that's the passage where he's talking about God can supply all our needs. I can do all things through Christ and and he talks about supplying the needs for the saints. And he's hinting about how, about how the Philippians, that he's writing to them, he says, you've, you've always supported me. And even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent more than once, you sent aid to me. So that probably speaks of some time period there. He writes to the Thessalonians, for you remember, brethren, our labor and toil for laboring night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. We preach to you the gospel of God. And he's talking about how the idea, what he's, what he's saying is that he got a job. He got a job making tents when he was in Thessalonica so he could help support himself. So this is a period of time that he's going to be in Thessalonica. Some people think several months. And he went into the synagogue and reasoned with them from the scriptures. You know, it really isn't that hard to talk to people about who the Messiah is from the Old Testament. It really isn't that hard. Um... Uh, and when you're talking to Jewish people, that's, that's the best place. There's over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament that speak about Jesus' first coming. Now, there's another 500 that speak about his second coming, but there's over 300. It talks about his birthplace, Micah 5, 2. But you, Bethlehem Ephrata, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, from you shall come forth to me, the one who to be ruler in Israel whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. It talks about his ministry. Uh, Isaiah 30, 35, 5. Then the eyes of the blind shall be open, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. That's some of the stuff that he did. He healed people. It talks about his death. For example, Isaiah, 30, 50, Isaiah 53, 5. I'm going to start transposing things. Um, dysle dys dyslexic I am. <laughs> no. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. I've got a friend who likes to share the gospel every chance he can get. And when he's talking with Jewish people and he shares some of these things, he, he, he quotes the verse to them, and they say, where's that? And he'll say, that's in your book, Isaiah. And they'll go, no. Blow them away, because most people read this and they'll, they'll understand who it's talking about. There's scriptures that talk about his resurrection. For example, this is one of the favorites of the apostles from Psalm 1610. You will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. 
that speaks about somebody not staying dead. Um, it's not hard to do. And so he is reasoning with them from the scriptures because he's in a synagogue. He's, he's reasoning with the Jews. And verse 4, some of them were persuaded. Some of them were persuaded. And a great multitude of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women joined Paul and Silas. A church is born. People are persuaded. Jews are persuaded and a great multitude of Greeks and some of the leading women. A church is established. If you want extra credit, gang, read First and Second Thessalonians. We think that after the book of Galatians, this is probably the, the next letters that he will write. Um, and uh, it's interesting, once you've gone through the book of Acts, to read some of these letters, because he puts in these little human interest tidbits, and you go, oh, oh, oh. Well, we'll see some of them. Um, Paul's going to write back to them and remind them of how they got started. I love this passage. This is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Paul says, For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. Talking about this period where he shows up and, he, and he's preaching and people come are persuaded. But even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know, remember that? That was last week. Remember they were beaten and thrown into jail. As you know, he says, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. A lot of, lot of arguing. For our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit, but as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. Neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak for covetousness. God is witness. He, they went out to, to make money off of them. Nor did we seek glory from men, neither either from you or from others, when we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. So affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become dear to us. He loved the, his time there. For you remember, brethren, our labor and toil for laboring night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. We preach to you the gospel of God. He didn't take up offerings in, Th in Thessalonica. He got a job on the side so he, would be, so he could just share the gospel without charge for them. You are witnesses, and God also, how devoutly, and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe. As you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his own children, that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom in glory. Sometimes we get the, this strange idea, and I know why, I, I probably helped promote the idea that Ministry is all about being the guy up front and, and, and talking at a bunch of people. And the bigger the crowd, the better. You know, and you, get, you can get a whole bunch of people listening to you. That's, that's ministry. But when you read what Paul says, that's not what it's all about. That's part of it. But it's about pouring your life out, connecting with people, loving on people. <laughs> Ministry meant a loving relationship with the people, opening his heart to them, spending time with them, pouring his life out to them. Um, I have to confess that I have sometimes said, I'd love the ministry if it weren't for the people. <laughs> and I'm not the only one in this room that said it. <laughs> because sometimes, the truth be told, that's the hardest part of ministry, is being with people who hurt you. You know, they, 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 among pastors, we joke and we say, that's the thing about sheep, you know, is that they bite. You know, you get too close to sheep, they're going to they're gonna bite you. But that's what ministry is all about, friends. It's about opening up your heart to people. It's about risking yourself. Um, it's about learning agape. Because agape requires that people be in your life to learn how to love. 
You can't love people if you're not connecting with people. So this ministry in Thessalonica may have only been a couple months, but there's a knit, a knitting of hearts here that's going on. It's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing. Verse 5. But the Jews who were not persuaded, because see, not everybody is persuaded, the Jews who were not persuaded, becoming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace and gathered a mob, set all the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. That's house of Jason. He's the guy that's apparently hosting uh, uh, Paul and the, the church, possibly. Now, there's a word that's translated, brought them out to the people. It's not a typical word, Greek word for people. This is the word demos. We get our word democrat from it or democracy from it. It, it, it speaks of a political group of people, a group of citizens. Thessalonica was a free or independent city. It had a ruling group of people called uh, the, the demoi would be plural, but the demoses. Um, that was their ruling group, the people. And so the mob is trying to have Paul put on trial before the ruling group. That's the picture here. This group was envious. That's the real motive behind the trouble. Paul and Silas are getting more attention than the other Jewish leaders. It's hard, gang, because um, jealousy happens everywhere, and it happens in church. It, uh, I, I, it's terrible among us pastors. We're some of the worst people in, in the world, jealous of each other, you know, envious of other other people's churches, you know, and, and you, you, uh, there's something evil in our hearts, you know, when you got friends who, and they, their church starts growing, and you think, well, that's not fair, how come my church isn't growing like this church, you know, and we, oh, we, we, terrible things we do in the ministry. Um, we'll find fault with other churches. We'll tell people why that church isn't as spiritual as we are it's better that there's just three of us here in church tonight, you know, because because we're more spiritual. You are the ones that are so spiritual to come to my Bible study. That's why you're here, you know. Everybody else is a bunch of flakes, you know. Paul writes to the Philippians while he's in jail about, about 10 years from now. And he writes this. It's true that some are preaching out of jealousy and rivalry, but others preach uh, preach about Christ with pure motives. They preach because they love me, for they know I have been appointed to defend the good news. Those others do not have pure motives as they preach about Christ. They preach with selfish ambition, not sincerely, intending to make my chains more painful to me. But that doesn't matter. Whether their motives are false or genuine, the message about Christ is being preached either way. So I rejoice, and I will continue to rejoice. That ought to be our attitude. You know, uh, maybe you don't agree with everything the other church does. Maybe they don't like the way they're doing stuff or the things that, you know, they promote. But if they're preaching Christ, that ought to be good enough for us. We ought to be cheering them on. Verse 6. But when they did not find them, see, they show up at Jason's house trying to find Paul, and they couldn't find him. They dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, these who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Now, that's kind of a, that's a drastic thing. You know, the, and you think about it, you've seen them, you know, I've just shown you little corners of the map. They haven't reached the whole world yet. But that is quite a, an interesting compliment, I think. You know, these people have turned up, turned the whole world upside down. Um, that's interesting. And but Jason and Jason has harbored them, and these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king, Jesus. Now, Paul's been preaching that Jesus is the Christ. The word means anointed one. It's a Jewish term. It's it's, it's, it's what you call the Jewish king, the Messiah, the, the, the Christ. 
and they're twisting it to make it sound as if Paul is preaching rebellion against Rome, which he wasn't. Jesus told Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Um, I think I think we have to be careful how we handle politics. Uh, don't get me wrong. We need to participate in the political process. Absolutely. We are salt and light in this world. And especially in this nation where our politics are supposed to be representative of the people, you need to speak up. Absolutely. But there's a point, gang, where you can't forget the truth is that this kingdom is not our kingdom. We ought to affect this kingdom. Absolutely. But you know what? I, um, I, I'm counting on a better kingdom. Much better kingdom. Um, and you see this here where these these uh, accusers are trying to make it a, a political thing that it's not. It's not. They're trying to get people saved. Verse 8, And they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city when when they heard these things. So when they had taken security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. So they asked Jason to put up some money, um, which he would lose if there's more trouble. That's the idea here, to take security from him. And uh, possibly the idea is that if Paul ever returns, then, then he doesn't get his money back, something like that. Paul would later write to the church, therefore we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again, but Satan hindered us. One suggestion is maybe it has something to do with this security thing, is that, is that Paul doesn't want Jason to lose his house or what, what. It could be something like that. That's just a theory of, of possibly how it could have been working. And it says they let them go, so they're going to leave town. Paul and Silas are going to leave town. Now, it might sound as if this is a terrible defeat for the church, that these enemies have won. Um, but the truth is, with the persecution, the church in Thessalonica grows and it has influence over the whole area. Paul will tell them, he says, so that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. For from you, the word of the Lord has sounded forth not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith toward God has gone out so that we do not need to say anything. This church became a place of influence. So even though Paul gets kicked out maybe after a couple of months, that doesn't stop the work because the seed has been planted. These men and women are following God. It's a real deal that's gone on in Thessalonica. Verse 10. So they leave Thessalonica in verse 10. Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now, Berea is about 50 miles southwest of Thessalonica. It's, it's across this plain here. It's up in the foothills. Um, this, is, this is mountain range here is actually the, where Mount Olympus is. It's in the foothills of Mount Olympus. Um, Berea, that's where Berea is. Today... The city is called Berea. Sounds like Berea. It should be because that's where they get the name. So it's just a twisting of the name. And it is one of the oldest cities of the world. It dates back to about 500 B.C. And they say that one of the oldest parts of the city is called the Jewish Quarter. So they go to Berea and they're going to speak to the Jews in Berea. Um, <coughs> something else I read about, about Berea is that there's not a lot of the ancient things because this, has been one, this is one of those continuously inhabited cities, so they've just kept building on top of it. So that's why there's not, it's not one of these, the cities that were wiped out, those are the ones you can go back and have the great archaeological digs because you can dig it all up. This is a city where they've built this city mostly on top of the old stuff. It says verse 11. So <coughs> in Berea, these were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness 
and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Um, have you ever heard the word eugenics? That's a word nowadays in, in, in genetic circles, eugenics. It means it's the science of, of having good genes. Um, the word that means fair-minded, it's that word, eugenics. E-U means good or well. Genes is the word for born, to be born. So it's well born. I think the old King James says they were more noble-minded. That's actually literally what it, what it is. They were more noble-minded. These were wet more, they're better, and this is what's called the comparative. It's not just fair-minded, but it's more fair-minded. There's, there's, um, there's an, an, this is the way you, you make adjectives, and I'm, I can't remember all the terms. There's the normal one, then there's comparative, which is more. So it's so there's fair-minded, more fair-minded, and then there would be what's the superlative, which is the most fair-minded. Well, this is that more fair-minded. Aren't, aren't you impressed? Okay. They're more fair-minded. These, these are, you know, you could think, these were, these are better people. These are better-bred people, people with, with a better upbringing, something along those lines. More fair-minded. You and I ought to be striving to be Bereans. This is a great, I love these people. These are great people. There's a couple of qualities about these Bereans that makes them more noble, more fair-minded than the folks in Thessalonica. First thing is that they have a hunger for the word. The word that was translated readiness, it said that they received the word with all readiness. The word readiness means um, prothumia, Thumia means um, passion, heat. Prothumia means it could be translated zeal, spirit, eagerness, inclination, readiness of mind. They receive the word with, with passion. They're hungry for it. Um, they, they couldn't wait to open their Bibles. They brought These people brought their Bibles to church. They took notes. They underlined stuff. They were waiting to, to hear the next thing and to, and to connect the dots and to put it all together. Psalm 119, verse 103, How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. God wants us to have a hunger, a zeal for his word. It's hard because when you've been a believer for a while, after a while, the zeal kind of dies down. It gets old. And you know what? Stir it up. Stir it up. Do something different. Um, one of the things that one of the things I've done over the last couple of years, um, I, I I still read through my Bible once a year, and I'm planning on doing that for the rest of my life because I'm just getting way too much out of it. I'm just having a blast doing this, and I have little notches in my belt, my Bible belt as well. You know, for every time I no, I know. Um, but one of the things that I'm doing that has really helped the last couple of years is, is um, and, and with all these electronic Bibles you get, like the U version, if you have, that's a d free download if you've got, you got a smartphone, is that there's a whole bunch of Bible versions that are free. And so what I'm doing now, the last couple of years, is I'm, I'm changing versions every year. Um, and yes, some of them are better than others. I, I, I can tell you that. But listen, uh, and, and I'm listening to them now, is, is what I'm doing now. I listen to it on my walk. So that I listen to my three chapters every day while I'm walking. And I, I used to kind of go to people who would say they would listen to their Bible on CD on their, on their drive to work. And I would think, oh, well, that's not really reading your Bible like you should. But when I'm, and I can't do it when I'm running. I, I can't, if I run, I'm, I'm too busy trying to not fall on my face if I'm running. So I just walk. Um, I, I'm learning that walking, I can walk and, and think and still think. And what I've been doing the last couple of years, um, I did ESV, the English Standard Version. Last year I did New Living Translation. And that was, that was a blast. That's, that's, that's like living it, reading it in fifth grade level or something. It's, it's, it's easy to understand. But hearing it, oh my goodness, I'm just, I'm thinking, oh, I, I don't remember it saying that, 
And then I'll go look it up and I'll go, well, there it is. But because you hear it in a different version, oh my gosh, gang, it just stirs it up. This year I'm being, I'm being really carnal and b- very bad. Don't tell anybody about it. Don't tell any of the Calvary pastors about this. This year I'm li- listening to the NIV. <laughs> we, what, do we used to call it? what do we used to call it? The newly inspired version, something like that. And, you know, and, and the guy that reads it, He's, he's got a, a bit of a British accent, not not too strongly, but his. It, you know, wow, I'm just enjoying it. I, I, there's this one part where I'm up on skyline and I'm about I'm about to cross cross Raymond, and uh, I can hardly wait till I get there now every day because that's about where I am when I when I'm done with my prayer list and I'm starting to listen to the scripture and I'm just I can I can I'm looking forward to it. Oh my goodness, I'm loving it. I. I, I, I kind of don't want to stop. Sometimes I, sometimes I've gone just a little bit longer because I just want to get it all in. I just love it, beloved. Hunger for God's word. That's part of what God wants for us. I, and if you're not hungering for it, do something to shake up the, rock the boat a little bit, make it a little bit different. Um, do something to bring back that excitement, like like it was the first time you read it. Do things to stir it up. There's a hunger for God's word. Uh, the second thing about them, I call it being scripture-based. It's because it says they searched the scriptures daily. The word search, anacrino, the word crino is the word to judge. Ana means again. Again, to judge again. To look at something, think it through um, crino can also, I, I think it actually can mean to divide. So you kind of, you pick something apart and you're kind of, you're kind of figuring it out. You know, you're kind of putting all the pieces, scattering it around. But anacrino means you do it again and again. So it's, it's, you're looking at, there's, 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 you go over and over and over to examine, to judge, to investigate, to sift, to question specifically in a forensic sense of a judge to hold an investigation. They searched the scriptures. They searched the scriptures. They made their decisions about the gospel. They're hearing this guy come in. The first time he's telling them that Messiah that we've been reading about, he showed up. He came. He actually came. And his name is Jesus. And let me show you all the things he's fulfilled. And they took this knowledge and they searched the scriptures and they tore it apart. And they found out That preacher's telling me the truth. They made their decisions based on the scripture, not based on society, not based on what their friends are telling them. They made their decision about the gospel based on the scriptures. Um, I think I've thrown this verse up here almost every week, 2 Timothy 3.16. It's a good verse to, to remember. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. That's what we need. We need to be searching the scriptures, examining over and over, judging the scriptures and making our decisions. And the last thing, uh, the last thing about them is that daily thing. They didn't get the word just once a week, friends. Every day. They searched the scriptures daily. They searched the scriptures daily. You know, there's that picture in the Old Testament about how God got his people through the wilderness for 40 years. How do you feed 2 million people in a desert for 40 years? Um, if you've ever been, ever been in the food service industry, that's a lot of food. Two million people. How do you feed that kind of people? God fed them manna. And and what happened is that they, they first they, they said, We're we've run out of food. What are we gonna do? And God sent this frost stuff. They're like I don't know, like maybe it was frosted for that flakes. I don't know. And they woke up in the morning and there's this dew all around the, and then and it kind of dries and it hardens and it's the stuff and they pick it up and said, What is this? And in Hebrew, the, what is this is manna. That's what manna means. I mean, what is it? What is it? That's, you know, that's what, that's what my wife sometimes says when I cook dinner. What is it? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> um, no, I, it's, I'm, I'm teasing. Um, I'm not, 
Yeah, I am that bad, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> but the thing about manna is you had to go out and get it every day. And you had to go out early in the morning. If you waited too long in the morning, it melted and it's gone. So if you didn't get up early, you didn't go out and search for it, it's gone. Daily, friends, daily. In the book, daily. Get up a little bit earlier. It doesn't take that much. Ten minutes. You know, when I'm listening to it, when listening to the scriptures, it's about 15 minutes. It doesn't take a lot of time. You can do that. 15 minutes a day. You didn't get up early enough. It all melts. It's gone. Or other people made the mistake that thought, well, I don't know if I can get up every day. But, you know, maybe a couple times a week. So today, uh, tomorrow, I'll get up early, get an extra big bucket, and fill it all up so I'll get a couple of days' worth. You know, go to church, and Pastor Rich will just pack it in, and that'll last me all week. Well, then you take the bucket home, and the first day, you, you, it's fine. It's manna just fine. The next morning, you get up in the morning to have your morning manna, manna cakes, and the worms are crawling in it. And <laughs> because you've got to go out every day. You've got to go out every day. Daily, they search the scriptures. Do you want to have a walk? With God, that's close. It's got to be daily, friends. You don't, you don't say hi to your sweetie but once a week. My goodness. Being married, it's a, it's an everyday thing. It's a more than once a day thing. It's time with each other. You walk with God, beloved. This is the Bereans. Get up early, spend time with God, hunger for it. It's out there, gang. The man is out there. Look for it. Tomorrow in our reading, we're going to get to watch the firstborn of all Egypt dying, the Passover. <laughs> oh, gosh, it's been freaky listening to the plagues this week. Oh, bugs crawling and the lightning and then the darkness. And the, oh, I'm sorry. Verse 12. Let's, let's get off of that. Verse 12. Therefore, many of them believed, and also, not, and also not a few of the Greeks. Therefore, many of them believed, and also not a few of the Greeks, prominent women as well as men. Kind of like Thessalonica. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was preached by Paul at Berea, they came there also and stirred up the crowds. These people that were jealous, they heard, they heard that they just moved down the street. And they're going to go ruin their day. And so this is very similar to what happened on that first missionary journey. Remember when they got in trouble at Antioch of Pisidia? That's the one in Galatia. And those fellows followed them for a couple of towns into Lystra and Derbe and all that kind of stuff, Iconium. So the same thing is happening with these Jews, these bad Jews from Thessalonica. Verse 14. Then immediately the brethren sent Paul away to go to the sea, but both Silas and Timothy remained there. Now, whether he actually takes a boat or just goes on the coastal route, we're not. the language is a little bit unclear, but he starts from Berea and he heads out to the Aegean Sea. It's possible that he gets on a boat and he might, he might make the trip around here to Athens. Um, Athens is about 200 miles from Thessalonica. Um, 400 years prior to this was when Athens was at its prime. But by this time, Athens is a little bit in decline. This is the Acropolis. That's the Parthenon on top. Um, and off to the side over here, there's an outcropping of rock called the Areopagus. You're going to see this in a minute. It's a little bit below the Acropolis, um, but you'll we'll see the importance of that in just a second. So... The brethren sent Paul away. <coughs> Paul's going to leave Berea, but Silas and Timothy um, are going to stay behind and help the church. Paul writes, therefore, when we could no longer endure it, we thought it good to be left in Athens alone and sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith. So not only do they stay back and help the folks in Berea, but also in Thessalonica. Silas and Timothy, while Paul goes off to Athens on, him, on his own. 
verse 15. So those who conducted Paul brought him to Athens and receiving a command from, for Silas and Timothy to come to him with all speed, they departed. So in other words, he goes to Athens by himself and then starts to get lonely. So he sends the guys that were with him. He says, how oh, rats, I, I got to have Timothy and Silas. Go, you go get them and bring them back as soon as you can. Um, 1 Thessalonians 3, 6, but now Timothy has just returned, bringing us good news about your faith and love. He reports that you always remember our visit with joy and that you want to see us as much as we want to see you. So he's kind of writing that after Timothy finally rejoins him. Interesting to put all this stuff together, to connect all these dots. Verse 16. Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. He, here he is at this great historic city. At one point, kind of the capital of the world in Greece, Greek Empire. He was provoked. Paroxuno, to sharpen, to stimulate, to spur on, to urge, to irritate, even, even get angry. He sees all the temples dedicated to the various gods. And he gets angry. He's stirred up over it. What moves you to share your faith? For Paul, he walks into Athens and he sees the city. You're looking up at the, the uh, up at the the, uh, the Acropolis, the, where the temp and the temple of Zeus is around the corner, and there's temples around the Areopagus. They're everywhere. Temples everywhere. People swallowed up with empty philosophy, and he's stirred up. He has to say something. For Dwight L. Moody, it was in the 1800s. It was after the great. Chicago Fire. In fact, the night before the sh great Chicago Fire, he was doing this series of messages. And he didn't give an invitation. He thought, well, I'll wait till the next night. And the fire hit, and a whole bunch of people died. And it stirred him up. Never again. Never again. Life is too short. I have to urge people to come to Christ. For some of us, it happens when a loved one is in the hospital or has died and you are faced with the reality every life is fragile. Got to, got to talk to them. Got to talk to them now before they're gone. I know I was stirred up this week with some of the stuff we talked about on Sunday. Thinking about Jesus coming back. What if Jesus came back in the next year or two? For reals came back in the next year or two. What if? I, you know, I was thinking about that on Sunday. I was thinking about, about it a lot. A lot. Shook me up. Did, did it shake anybody else up? Shook me up. What moves you? What does it take to get you moving? It may not be the, the gods around you. Maybe it's when we start watching what's really going on in people's lives. I like this little video. I <sighs> kid, every time I'm pulling out, he's right there. Man, and someone needs to talk to his parents <laughs> if they're ever at home. What is up with the traffic today? It's in always, every day, this intersection is always crowded. I hate pulling out of here. I need some of these dumb roads. Oh, there's... Oh. <laughs> okay, so I'm not even here. Right. Great lady. The princess of parking. Sure. Take this spot. Way to be considerate. Oh kidding me? Unbelievable. Oh. Thank you, ma'am. Oh, it's about time. Let's see, what do I want? Uh, yeah, can I add a cookie to that order? Yeah, no problem. Yeah, uh, no problem, only guy in the world. I'm sure you need your cookie. The world, your oyster, and he's serving your cookie. Thank, Thank you so much. Uh -huh. What can I get for you? Uh, yeah, I'll have a tall decaf macchiato. Yeah, sure, no problem. The 385.
And uh, it might take a few minutes here. We've got quite a line, obviously, and thanks for your patience. Great. Yeah, <laughs> great. Great for me. Waiting again. Unbelievable. What? What am I supposed to do? How can I how can I do anything about that? Can I even help with that? I don't your copy, sir. Oh. I can't I can't take this anymore. I gotta get out of here. Hey, what? Buddy, come here. I remember as a college student being instructed to. Uh, I was in a um, like with Campus Crusade, and we were told that one of the things we should try to do is to go to the top of the Humanities Building at Cal State Fullerton, um, eight stories, and uh, go to the top and look out over the balcony and just watch the students coming and going, and to get a vision for reaching the campus for Christ. Um, Matthew chapter 9 says, When Jesus saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. And he said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Maybe go to work early someday. And just watch the people come in. Ask God to open your heart. Ask God to open your eyes. Paul was torn up when he sees the people in Athens. He's got to do something. Therefore, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews, with the Gentile worshipers, and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. The word reason, uh, we get our word dialogue from it. He was dialoguing with people, all kinds of people, with the Jews in the synagogue, with the Gentiles in the marketplace. Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him, and some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. Epicureans followed the teachings of Epicurus about 340 B.C., 300 B.C. His, he said that the chief end of man was pleasure and happiness like this. Now, I haven't seen this movie, but I do. I, I, this, the, the, the trailer is what this is all about. 
Through a night we'll never forget. That's Epicureanism, a taste of it. Um, the followers tended to lead life by trying to please their senses, eat and drink for tomorrow we die. We think of Epicureans as people who you know, are into food, but it's more than just food. Stoics followed the teachings of a guy named Zeno around the same period of time. He taught on a porch, and the Greek word for porch is stoa. That's where we get the word stoics, because the guy taught on the porch. They emphasized the rational over the emotional. Kind of reminded me of... Opportunity? Now listen, Spot, you may be a wonderful science officer, but believe me, you couldn't sell fake patents to your mother. I fail to understand why I should care to induce my mother to purchase falsified patents. Curious. Most illogical. And I'm sick and tired of your life. We could use a little inspiration. Step by step, I have made the correct and logical decisions. And yet two men have died. And you brought our foreign friends down on us. You have miscalculated regarding them and inculcated resentment on your parts. Some of the parts cannot be greater than the whole. A little less analysis and more action. That's what we need, Mr. Spock. So he's the ultimate stoic. Mr. Spock, all, all logic, no emotions. These guys had no fun. They're the ones who thought they were better than everyone else. And uh, the first two leaders of the Stoic School of Philosophy committed suicide because life was so fun. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the Stoic. So the two opposites, and they're arguing with Paul. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying... May we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak. The Areopagus, the name means um, the rock, the pagas, the rock of Ares. He's the god of war. The Romans romanized this, this word to, the, to Mars Hill. You will hear there's churches called Mars Hill because they try to rationalize and dialogue with people. That's the idea. It was the tallest hill, or it's a tall hill northwest of, of the Acropolis. We saw it on the map. And in the early days, it was where the ancient courts were before this. Paul's not being brought to court. This is just where the smart philosophers are reasoning, thing out and reasoning things out and want to hear him uh, give his case for what he believes. Verse 20, so for you are bringing some strange thing to our ears, therefore we want to know what these things mean. For all the Athenians and the foreigners who were who were there spent their time in nothing else but to either tell or to hear some new thing. So they are really what they just want, they just want to hear what the latest thing is. They uh, don't, I'm not sure they're there to hear truth. They just want to hear what the latest buzz is. And they probably considered what Paul was saying. Fascinating is a word I use for the Fascinating. unexpected. Fascinating. Now, I've got a minute and a half of that. I don't have time for all of this uh, thing. So I'm sorry. I went off on a little Star Trek binge today, so forgive me. Verse 22, then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. Um, you could almost use the word superstitious. Um, they feared gods or demons, literally. Verse 23, for as I was, oh, did I get to the, okay, there we go. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you. Now, just to make sure they had all their bases covered, because they worshiped everybody else, they made sure they had like a catch-all, a miscellaneous God. They called him the unknown God, just in case we offend, we don't want to offend any of the other gods, so in case... We missed somebody, we've got an unknown God. It's kind of like Elvis, I understood towards the end of his life, he had lots of gold jewelry and had all kinds of religious things. And somebody asked him why he was wearing so many different religious things, and he, he said to them, just covering my basis, uh-huh, uh-huh, something like that. That's the unknown, sorry, that is bad. I shouldn't, don't even, I won't ever do that again, sorry. He says, whom you worship without knowing, I want to explain to you. 
He starts where they're at. That's a good thing. Um, He doesn't rebuke them for their idolatry. He uses it to talk about Jesus. He starts with the fact that they do seem to be quite religious. God, who made the world and everything in it, (coughs) since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. He's going to use creation. Um, the scripture tells us that, that creation, all of creation, speaks of a creator. It's kind of obvious. Um, verse 25. Let me just go on to verse 25. Nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. Um, just one, I was going to say that he doesn't need you because he kind of really doesn't need you. Psalm 50 talks about this. And uh, we're running out of time, so I'm not going to read all those. You can read that extra credit. Um, some churches may give you the impression that God needs you to do something. He kind of really actually doesn't. You need him. You need him. Um And uh, verse 26, and he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth, and he has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. God is a great God. He even speaks of things ahead of time, hundreds of years before they happen, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your poets have said, for we are also his offspring. It is interesting that Paul quotes two Greek poets. Um, Some of us Bible followers give the impression that the only book that we ever read is the Bible. And that's a good book to read. That's the book you ought to be reading every day. But you know what? Paul apparently was familiar with Greek poets, secular poets, and he quotes them. It's kind of interesting. Verse 29, Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, shaped something shaped by art and man's devising. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to, to repent. God's overlooked this this time he's shown patience towards towards mankind but now it's time to turn around because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained he has given assurance of all to of of this to all by raising him from the dead he's saying god will one day judge and this is paul's reason Why he's talking to people. This is why we ought to warn people because there will be a day of judgment. We can try to pretend that it's not going to happen, but there will be a day of judgment. Everybody will one day stand before God. That ought to be our motivation to show people there is a way out of this. And Jesus is the one. And when they heard, verse 32, of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, while others said, we will hear you again on this matter. Some mocked, perhaps, well, the Epicureans, the the pleasure folks, didn't believe in life after death. And so they would have thought that Paul was crazy. So Paul departed from among them. However, some men joined him and believed. Among them, Dionysius, the Areopagite, a woman named Damaris, and others with them. So didn't have a lot 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 of converts in Athens. Um, We don't have a record of a church being established yet. Some people, though, did join him, including a fellow named Dionysius Dionysius the Areopagite. This was a guy who was a part of this judging group that made judgments on on the Areopagus. And so this was apparently a pretty sharp cookie um, that was part of the group that came to follow Jesus. And with that, we are done. Let's stand and pray.